Hello and welcome to Finding Respect on the Chaos on Finding on Think Tech Hawaii. Excuse me. I'm here with Dr. Caroline Sakai. Thank you so much for coming, Caroline. Thank you for having it's me. Very nice to have My you. My honor. Thank you. Um, Caroline was a guest here one other time too, and she's been doing some amazing work in Rwanda. Um, I know that usually my format is just, you know, abuse and, and advocates, but it's also, I'm finding respect in all this chaos. And there's plenty of chaos out there. And this is some very exciting, important success that's happening out there to help people really recover from trauma. Yes. I, uh, I first want to recommend this book, Overcoming Adversity, um, that Caroline wrote that is just a remarkable book. It is a page turner. You will not be able to put it down. And it really talks about some important things that you have done in Rwanda. If you would please tell us a little bit about how you got started and going there and, and just exactly what is this energy tapping thing? What, what is it? Yeah, I'll, I'll address that uh, last question first. Okay. <laughs> the energy tapping is being able to use as a self-treatment the meridians that are used in acupuncture and acupressure to okay. promote healing and health. And it's something you can do yourself and you can do it as often as you like. It has been a godsend to working with things like traumas, phobias, anger, okay. depression, anxiety. Okay. And it has also worked with physical pain and a lot of physical issues as well. And okay. we have actually been able to help people that have been like on. 18 different pain medications and have problematic effects with the opioids sure. and be able to get off all of the medications and be able to treat pain just with the self-tapping wow. and get much better results. So that has been happening. We've had some people go only from 10 to an 8 on 8 or 9 different medications simultaneously with bad side effects and be able to bring it down to like a 1 or a 2 just with using the tapping, which is a healthy self-treatment alternative. Right. And, you know, I know that for many years it wasn't actually an evidence-based yes. practice, right? So it wasn't approved by, you That's know, it wasn't right. in the a book. A lot of and opposition. A lot of, and I think it's because they didn't want to put the healing into the hands of the patients. They want to be the ones that do the healing. I'm not sure. But at any rate, I'm so grateful. Tell us a little bit how, how that all came about. Yes, and the story ties in together with how it became evidence-based and our work in Rwanda, because they, they're actually ones we can credit for helping us become evidence-based. I got interested in going to Rwanda after working out in New Orleans, post-Katrina, went there three times, worked with Charity Hospital and Children's Hospital, and we had about 11 to 13 therapists from all over the United States and some other countries, including from Europe, that we were helping with uh, working with trauma there. And we were seeing fabulous results. But one of the psychologists, Paul Ulas, who is a, also a pastor in California, said, it's wonderful that we're helping in New Orleans but where we are very much needed and maybe have a moral obligation to go is in Rwanda because he said there's more than a million people that have been traumatized by the genocide with almost a million people killed in 1994 wow. when the United States was really very much preoccupied with the Monica Lewinsky scandal. So we failed to make a strong statement against the genocide, which is what they were asking of us. And because of that, he felt that it was imperative because he saw them 11 years after the genocide, and he said they're still a debilitated nation. Mm. Flashbacks, nightmares, sure. people aren't able to function, kids aren't able to learn and study. And we thought that's something we ought to try to see what we can do to maybe make up for our right. failure to help yeah. at the time they were asking us for help. So we went 12 years after the genocide, and we started with uh, children. There were 400 children at an orphanage. I think we have a picture of I that I think we do too, have right? a picture of uh, some of the, I think there's about there 200 of the 
children are in the photograph. And we worked with this orphanage. And these kids, for 12 years, were still in a transitional school. They couldn't really concentrate because of the flashbacks and the nightmares. So they were still unable to really progress in their reading and writing and math. After they were treated for the traumas, they were able to focus and concentrate without the distractions of the constant flashbacks and nightmares. They were able to concentrate and learn without the depression and anger and fear. And within one year after they were treated for the genocide traumas, they were able to pass the competitive Rwandan exams and get into the regular public schools. Wow, so I it just was got just awesome. I got chicken skin <laughs> all over my arms. Just now. And it was funny because we, how beautiful that we is. We had uh, thought we'd maybe do a little bit of a like a slight little randomized control study. So we had the children, one third of them randomized into like the thought field therapy tapping. One third of them were doing tension relaxation. And one third of them were doing the four by four breathing exercise to get them to calm down and relax. And we thought, uh, well, they're all in the same orphanage, but they don't have electricity. So we were there from dawn to dusk. And right. we thought we're there when they wake up and we're there when they go to sleep. So and then we're there when they wake up again the next morning so we can do the reverse, you know, the, the second condition and the, the, the third day, the third condition. Well. After the first night, you know, because they have nightmares. Yeah. So they wake up. So the kids having the nightmares that doing the TFT said, oh, the nightmare recedes and they can go back to sleep. And they're very helpful to each other. So they notice, oh, I, what are you doing? Why aren't you sleeping? They say, oh, because of the nightmares. You know, they're doing either the tension relaxation or they're doing the breathing relaxation. They said, no, I don't think you're doing it right. You need to do this. So they're showing them how to do the thought field therapy. Uh -huh. So the next day, when the, we're talking to kids to change the position, mm -hmm. and we asked them, well, how was your night? They said, well, I wasn't doing too well. But then, you know, Joey came over and said, hey, what are you doing? And showed me how to do this thing. And that worked. And so by the second day, they all knew thought field therapy. They had learned from the other kids. They taught themselves, yes. so they definitely so did that. So we said, so much for a randomized <laughs> control study. <laughs> right. However, we found something even better. Right. They were able to learn from the other kids right. who had just learned it. Which is the best thing It was of just all. the best because they, what the, we have seen, and this is a, what inspired us to look at, we need to somehow be able to do this in our country. They immediately took it everywhere, into the schools, everywhere. And the children were teaching other children. And they had TFT, spontaneously formed TFT, uh, like TFT clubs. So kids <laughs> are helping other kids and they says, oh, you got that pain there, well, do this. And so they're teaching each other in the support group. So that was happening there, and it all across the communities. That's what we saw in the schools, and was just amazing. The, we saw the transformation of these children, not only in terms of their learning, but I think we have a, a, a slide that shows they were, when we got there, they were eating rice and beans. Oh, yeah, and right. Then I think we're went, there we at, go. They got inspired. They started uh, getting planting seeds. It's a and they had help the from Oxen. Huge cabbages. Oh, yes. my so goodness. they had enough to feed all of the orphans and also that eventually they got enough to even sell some to market. So wow. becoming more self sustaining. So it was just very uh, inspiring to see the transformation. Right. Sure. It was like goosebumps again. I feel like I'm going to cry. My eyes are filling up, but this is an incredible story. It's so beautiful that they could, yes. you could make such a, a marked difference. In a their market lives. difference. And when we saw these differences, we're looking at, um, we were working with adults too, the adult genocide survivors. We worked with widows. I think we have a picture of the widows. Um, these are some of the widows right. that we worked in. And they were, uh, there were efforts like with Oxfam to try to help them, but because they were so depressed and traumatized and not able to concentrate, they weren't able to fully benefit from the efforts to try to help them to become self-sustaining. 
after their traumas were treated, they were able to become very successful. So now it was, it was kind of uh, funny. We went to look and they have all these store warehouses with potatoes and other crops that they're tilling. And we looked out in the fields because there's a, like, a, because a, it's more, was more of like a male dominated uh, right. society. And especially if you don't have money, which of course the widows were very poor. So there was a lot of discrimination. Widows, single mothers had a lot of discrimination. And when we looked out in the fields, we kind of blinked our eyes and we said, hey, there were lots of men in the fields killing the, killing the fields and package, uh, hauling the potatoes, you know, in bags of potatoes and carrying them. And we said, those are, the, the men are carrying the potatoes and digging up the potatoes. And the widows laughed and they said, yes, we have been able to hire them. <laughs> To, oh my gosh! Help, help us with the work, and we thought, wow, wow what a transformation! Yes. And from you know when we first saw the widows, most of them had uh, they're still beautiful clothes with their colors, but then they had you know no shoes. Many of them, when we saw them, and as we go over years and years later, now uh, recent years, they all have shoes. In fact, they have purses. They have fine clothes. The, the, we have some, uh, I don't have the slide here, but we see them in the beautiful uh, clothes and with the uh, elegant uh, shawls and purses and How very wonderful. elegant. Yes. That is an amazing transformation, is right. Such a transformation. And in fact, uh, the mayor of one of the um, parishes that we worked in said, you know, when he first got there, he would wave to people, but they were so still depressed and distraught from the genocide. This is even 12, 13, 14 years later. And, and he said, after they were treated, after we came and we were treated, he said they would wave back and they had the enthusiasm and they're more productive, they're working. And so they said, wow, they're very giving people. So they said, wow, we are so fortunate we're so blessed that you came to help us because now we are getting healthier, we are getting happier, we're getting more productive. And they said, wow, we're very envious of you in the United States because you've had this around Roger Callahan, the clinical psychologist who developed it. He passed away a few years ago, but he had developed it. And he's, they said, it's been around for 40 years. Everyone in the United States must be healthy and happy because they saw it. So in such a short time, <laughs> the progress that they were making. Right. And we said, well, actually, you're ahead of us because you got it into your military, into the schools, you got it everywhere. We're still trying to get it in there because we need to have evidence-based right. practices. And they wanted to know what that was. And when we explained it, they said, well, why don't you do what you did for us, you know, you show them how it works. And he says, oh, that's great. And then they'll do it. <laughs> Does it work we, that way in America? <laughs> we need to have where we show that it's better than this control treatment. And then, you know, and they said, well, but then the control treatment, you mean they don't have the treatment that you know works? I said, oh, no, no, no. After it's still, they'll get the treatment after we show that, you know, without that treatment, right. the control treatment doesn't work as effectively. And then we'll give them the treatment. So they said they have to wait longer to get the treatment you know works. So oh my God. Yeah, they thought, this crazy. doesn't make sense. But they then said, we would like to help. How can we help? Because we said we haven't been able to get these studies. And right. they said, is there any way we can help? And that's how we were able to get two randomized control studies with adult wow. genocide survivors oh randomized into the control and regular condition. And we removed our foreign factor, you know, just because that might be, right. have a little compounding effect. Okay, wait, I have to stop you. I'm sorry. Okay. I, don't, I don't mean to stop you because I'm, I'm so wrapped up in this, but I know I have to take a break. So we'll be back in just one minute. Please don't go anywhere. There is more to the story that you are going to for sure want to hear. We'll be right back.
Aloha, I'm Gwen Harris, the host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of the supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. <laughs> Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm so glad you stayed with us because this is an amazing story. We are talking with Dr. Caroline Sakai about some of her work in Rwanda. And it is important work that affects us here in America. Um, I, was so, I was so struck when you said these kids were going, hey, you guys must be the healthiest, happiest people in the world because you've had this for so long. And yet we didn't. So, so bring us back up to, you guys were doing the randomized studies. The government decided, well, let's see what we can do to help you. Yeah, it wasn't going. the government, but it was the people. Okay, the, the people, people in the different villages. And so they helped us with doing two randomized control studies. And we removed a foreign factor by training Rwandans. And they don't have enough mental health and health professionals. Oh. So many of the people trained were lay people, but they did phenomenal work treating the, after we trained them, they were treating the genocide survivors. Wow. The results were just so amazing. It just blew the independent researchers from University, uh, University in Arizona who scored and compiled the statistics. They said, I think something's wrong because the results look too good to be true. And so they did it with another team, did it twice and had the same results. Wow. So it was just awesome. <laughs> after those were published, David Feinstein, who was a clinical research professor at John Hopkins, he's no longer there, but he did a meta-analysis of 51 energy tapping studies. 18 of them were randomized control studies. So he included our studies. And after that was published, then thought therapy was finally accepted as an evidence-based therapy. All right. right. Okay. You know, I, I know about this because I use this technique of, of myself. Um, being a survivor of domestic violence and child abuse, I have all kinds of hidden trauma that I'm not quite sure about. That I've done a lot of emotional work. I've done a lot of psychological work. Yeah. I've done a lot of work over the, you know, the 30 years since I first remembered. And, and yet I never could get that extra release until I started doing this. Now, and I know some of you <laughs> might be the same as I am, the tapping thing I, mm -mm. Yeah, you can do I it by tapping tap. or massaging, but you can also do it mentally. Right, which mm -hmm. I can't quite, I haven't perfected that one yet. <laughs> That's really hard to do. I can see how you could do it, yes. but it's really hard to do. So, um, but for me, just holding that yes, spot. Yes, you can just hold Or it. just massaging that spot a little bit. I don't actually have to tap. No, you can just cue it. Right, and I have personally experienced profound healing from some of the really deep hidden stuff. And so I think that if you are a survivor out there, I want you to try to give this a try because I will tell you, it really helps. It really works. When you get that flush of all the cort you know, cortisol and all the you know, adrenal axis stuff starts just flowing around and you're so stressed and you feel like you're gonna have an anxiety attack maybe even you can go through these protocols in a matter of minutes and you will feel better. And I mean, you will instantly feel better. Okay, enough about me. Let's get back to this because I don't want to run out of time and I want people to hear what I consider the most dramatic story that you have in showing how much this works when you went into the prisons and there was a, 
a poli tell them the police oh, story, yes. please. <laughs> yes, among the people that we had trained was a very charismatic policeman. And he was very successful in his parish. There, he was teaching everybody the thought field therapy, so murder, suicide, domestic violence all went down. He was doing very well in his parish. And then he was falsely accused. And then you have to go into the prison until your trial. And there are 13 prisons there, but oh there are no um, holding cells for people. So he's just in with general down. population? With the people that he sends that to he's prison. he's been sending to yes. Oh, my gosh. I can't so imagine a policeman in prison. He was in prison and feeling very uh, apprehensive, seeing, wow, there's a, a whole slew of people in there that probably would like to get a chance to kill me. Yeah. yeah. So, so he said uh, he knows how to do it mentally. He can do it mentally. But he said, "Wow, uh, his heart was palpitating, shaking, sweating." And so he just started tapping for the trauma treatment, and he started doing that. And his palpitation stopped, the shaking stopped, the sweating stopped. And he thought it was rather ludicrous. Here's here he is in prison, right. and, uh, fearful for his safety and well-being, and he's not having health palpitations. So he laughed out loud, and one of the prisoners, not someone he had sent to prison, came over and said, hey, aren't you a policeman? He said, yeah. He said, well, you know, you know what happens to policemen? <laughs> right. He said, well, yes, that's why I'm, I'm doing this. And the guy said, you know, there's two people in here that I think they're out after me, so can you show me how to do that? So he shows him how to do the treatment, and the guy's fear Hates. And so he thought it was funny. So he starts laughing. So here's the two of them laughing in this prison, which is a pretty gloomy place. And so then other people get curious and say, why are you guys laughing? So pretty soon, he's the most popular person in the prison because everybody wants to know. And does it work for this pain here? And I've got this phobia here and I've got this anger here. And oh so goodness. he starts, so he has trained all the prisoners except the people that he had sent to prison and had even trained all the prison guards because they were curious too. So sure. they're all always around him. And so can't get close to him. So finally one of the people he had sent to prison comes over and said, what's this stuff you guys are doing? So he shows him how to do the rage and anger treatment. His rage and anger melted, and he sits down with the rest of them, and he says, oh, and I've got this pain here, and I've got this trauma <laughs> here. And so he, he helps him. And so pretty soon, all of the prisoners, oh, every wow. single one, and, and so not only the policeman survived, he, when he went to trial three months later, he was acquitted of all charges. But when he left prison, he said, now I understand why God sent me here. He's a devout, right. devout Catholic, but had questioned because you know why is oh God, after doing you things, yeah, everything doing right in, in his life trying to help everybody sure. why is he sent to prison so he then said i will go to the rwandans because we trained for rwandans in hawaii to become trainers so they could train other people so we wouldn't have to keep going so that was working <laughs> really well until then this uh with the, with the, what happened with the policeman. And David Feinstein, who was writing the forward to my book, said, you don't have my favorite story in there, so we got permission. And then after we got the permission, because the government had to look at it, and they had right. testimonials from Bishop and many people from Rwanda and also in the United States, so they gave permission. So it's in the forward to the book, the policeman story. But after that came out, the Rwandan government asked the four Rwandans that we had trained here in Hawaii to come to their 13 prisons to train the prison staff. And I think we have one of the slides shows the staff yeah. that from the 13 oh, wow. prisons that we trained. Look at them all. And they said, you have to come back because we're, we're pastors and priests and we're going to be training like psychiatrists, doctors, nurses psychologist, social worker, so we need your help. So I had kind of retired from going there and just <laughs> connecting with them by internet. So that's why we've been going back two years, 2017, 2018. And we have one more trip this August because we're going to be training people in the prisons to be able to continue the training. What they're doing in the prisons 
is a model, I think, for transformation in the prisons. They took 50 model prisoners, they trained them, and then they do one-on-one -on -one therapy if it's needed. Weekly, they have reviews, and those 50 then help because some of the prisons have 12,000 inmates. Wow. So then each time they're then spreading out and training more it's and like more and, and more. In pool. And their <laughs> goal is to train every single prisoner. And when they're released from prison, they are expected to go into their community and help anyone who has not yet been treated for trauma or depression or right. rage or whatever. And it's a transformation because we've heard testimonials from many of the prisoners who said, you know, I, I was feeling depressed and hopeless. I'm going to be 30 years here. But they said, I now have a new purpose in my life. I never realized how much joy you can have from helping others because I was hurting other people. I wasn't helping them. Right. Now I'm getting real joy from truly helping other people so their lives are transformed. <laughs> okay, now I start crying again. <laughs> oh my gosh. So they changed the um, the statistics too for the, like the rapes and the murders and the suicides oh, yes, and stuff too, right? Oh yes, it's coming down. Yes, they're really coming down. And also they're uh, transforming the prisons because they're becoming like model prisons. And we looked at it and we said, wow, this is just amazing. And they said, well, if you need help, you know, they want to give back. So right. they said, if you need help in the United States, we can come to help you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we'll have, we might take them up on I it. I think we should. <laughs> oh, especially right now in this climate, of what we got going on. Maybe we could send him to the White House. What do you think? <laughs> that uh, would be cool. I, don't know. I don't think he'd talk to him. But shoot, wouldn't that be nice if we could? Oh, my gosh. There's so much more to talk about. Oh, yes. And I wish we had more time, but I know we're out of time now. And, oh, my goodness. I hope that you will come back again and talk about what happened in August in your sure, next trip. Sure, absolutely. And I'm just Love so to. moved and inspired by what you're doing and the results that are happening. And I hope that this can spread like wildfire here in America in the same way that it has spread like wildfire. I hope so too. It Rwanda. has literally transformed the nation of Rwanda. And right. we were told that by many people in Rwanda that it has transformed the country. Wow. To peace and reconciliation and forgiveness, which is their president has uh, decreed that and it's something that is helping them move along in that direction. And something I think uh, every country could learn sure. from and benefit from because they were a country that was so debilitated and so devastated by the horrors of the genocide. And you see them today. I mean, they have a national unity day every, once a month on a Saturday. And the entire nation does the same thing, whether it's sweeping and cleaning the roads or repairing a building in disrepair. Men, women, bosses, little children, everyone is coming together all across the nation, one Rwanda, one nation, in unity, doing the same thing. It That's is inspiring. So miraculous. It's it is very inspiring. inspiring. Very inspiring. I absolutely agree. And I know that it has helped me. And in, in ways I, I didn't expect. I have bad test anxiety, right? And I'm back yes, in college. Uh -huh. So I'm sitting there going, because uh, <laughs> I usually take it in the test center and I couldn't get in there. So I had to take it with the regular class. And I'm thinking, oh, it's my final. I'm going to wreck it. Right? So I just did one. And I knew it wasn't the right one, maybe. But I just did one of my protocols. And I got an A on the test. Right All on. of that anxiety, the shaking, the I can't think straight was gone. Right, and the anxiety protocol runs through most of the treatments. It's a real basic. Right. So you are doing the right thing. <laughs> I know it works. Yes. I know it works on simple things like you're taking a test and you're too nervous. And I know it helps on profound trauma for my own self with my own abuse. And as I'm writing my book now, telling the story of my life, I have all these flashbacks. And then I go through one of the protocols. And I can continue writing. And so what it's done for the Rwandans, I hope it will do 
for us here too. And I want to thank you for coming on and thank sharing Thank you so the story. much for having me. So I'm excited to hear you come back and tell us what happens in August. So um, maybe next fall you'll be able to come back and see us again. I'd be delighted to. Thank Thanks you so much. Coming. And I want to thank everybody out there for tuning in with us. Um, this has been a powerful story that can really change lives. And like I said before, if you are someone who has been abused, I really want you to look into this. Get this book, Overcoming Adversity. It will really help you. Um, just reading the book alone, you can get all kinds of stuff out of it. And the appendix, how to do it. The appendix, exactly, tells you how to do it and everything. And if you need more questions, her contact information is in there. She is a local doctor here in Honolulu, and I, I can't recommend all of this highly enough. So I want to thank you for tuning in. This has been Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Please come back next time.